This came through my door this morning. Electrical muscle stimulation. What the hell does that involve? You might think there's altogether too much obsessing over human body types going on in the world, but no one's interests seem particularly aligned with making it easy to happily accept a normal, healthy body shape. I was a chubby teenager, so I, maybe I think about it more than most people. In quarantine, I ordered an exercise bike for crying out loud, and then I used it not very often at all. Over the years, my mind, apparently without any conscious decision-making on my part, has gently observed that golden-skinned actress on the side of the bus shelter, and Brad Pitt in Fight Club, and the totally implausible Liz Hurley, and of course the ever-haunting Joe Wicks, and all those other bastards, and silently constructed some dehydrated, vac-packed, fluttering Frankenstein image of harmonious perfection it can't even pin down, or specifically show me when I ask it to. And yet, even though I can only catch taunting glimpses of this evil thing in my mind that it's made, it slid into a place of unwarranted authority nonetheless. How? Why? What if my body was never meant to be ladled into these puckered up nightmare configurations? What if it doesn't have to be any particular shape at all? Can a fountain pen review offer liberation from the crippling mind clutches of Jennifer Aniston's hair and all those other lingering snapshots of implausible polish that I and many of my ilk have been saddled with? Well, I'm not making any promises, but let's bloody hope so. Today's pen is the unassumingly named Duke 600. This pen has taken me back, slipping and sliding over its Rubenesque undulations, back, back, back in time, even further back than is becoming usual for a Panda Pen Club video, to a time when a, a well-nourished, positively overflowing physique may well have been genuinely genuinely, vaunted and adored, held up to the status of an icon. Welcome back to Panda Pen Club, the fountain pen channel where we aspire to hunt down and sniff out the most arresting, intriguing and reasonably priced fountain pens on the planet. First impressions of the Duke 600. What I found most striking and notable right away is the shape. This bulbous, droplet-like, pear-shaped impression, which is accentuated even further when the pen is uncapped and when you're writing with it. I'll get on to the writing experience later. But to begin, let's focus on initial impressions, the shape, specifically the pear shape. This is what instantly hit me with this pen. Now, perhaps some people find fruit-based metaphors to describe human body types to be controversial. Perhaps they feel likening our bodies to apples and pears is a step too far towards objectifying our precious habiti, leaving us ripe for unwelcome evaluation by others. Well, we can always retreat into the sterility and legitimacy of science. That immediately serves to obscure our shared quest to appraise other people's bottoms in the language of noble endeavour and progress. Somato typing is what we're doing when we're studying body types. This is a word coined by William Sheldon in the 1970s in his book Varieties of Human Physique, where he divided body types into endomorphs, mesomorphs, and ectomorphs. As you may be able to imagine, people have been larking around with endeavors like this for some time. Hippocrates, who, like Sheldon, believed that you could infer a person's personality and psychology based on 
their body type. Bastard. At some point between 460 and 377 BC, classified into two types. The physic habitus, which is vertical, dominated, long and thin, and the apoplectic habitus, which is more of a sort of sideways impression. Short and sort of thick-set, dumpy, I think is where he's headed with that. Something roughly to correspond with Sheldon's endomorph. And we can even waddle all the way forward through the centuries, leaving who knows how many classification systems in our wake to the 20th century. Italian anthropologist Viola, whose system involved delineating our poor, precious, personal, private, environmental put-togethers into somewhat similar classifications. Via some complex mathematical scrutiny, Viola would then home in on various bits and bobs and whether those various bits and bobs that people were actively presenting to the world as they went around their unassuming daily lives were harmonious, whether they were balanced and whether they were perfect, or in contrast to resplendent harmony, whether they were lumpen forms that fell into the deviant categories of brachytipo and longitipo. Each of these somatotypographologists, or however it is these judgmental pervs like to hear themselves referred, each of the lexicon, these guys and many more created arguably like pear-shaped, endomorphic, these phrases all carry with them a moralizing and ideological logical undertone. Something like, this, this over here is normal and that isn't. And by the way, I'm just talking literally about your body shape. Don't give a toss about your BMI or your BMR or your visceral fat readout. No, don't give a hoot about that. Just quite simply put. I examine your shape and then I put you and your shape into a lovely category I've created all by myself, that's all. How can we free ourselves of all this moral and ideological baggage? All this playground scar tissue some of us have to hump around. and quite contend with half our lives. How do we disentangle what we actually think about bodies from what we've been told to think? If only we could access the minds of people who existed before all this socially generated stuff started interfering with our brains. What if we could go back to the very cusp of behavioural modernity. The upper Paleolithic, say? Maybe 35, 40,000 years ago. And once we were there, we could, we could look inside people's heads and see what they thought. Well, we sort of can. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Venus of Holofels. This remarkable object, sculpted from mammoth ivory, was found in 2008 in a cave system nine miles west of Ulm in the German state of Baden-Württemberg by Professor Nicholas Conard of the University of Tübingen. And it has been dated to approximately 40 thousand years ago, making it the earliest known example of figurative art. But despite its remarkable claim to fame, it is far from alone. It is merely the oldest member of an entire category of upper Paleolithic portable art known as Venus figurines. They usually depict a human female of voluptuous and somewhat pronounced dimensions. They are typically sculpted in the round, i.e. not attached to any sort of background, that being a relief. Their arms and legs tend to taper away to nothing, no hands or feet, and no visible face. They range between three centimeters and 40 centimeters in height. 
Our lady from Hollow Fells clocking in at six centimetres tall herself. Indeed, one thing that struck me about this last factoid is that they have remarkable dimensional similarities to fountain pens, which are similarly portable. Now, I'm not Howard Hughes enough yet to have catalogued every fountain pen I own. Now, have you any questions? Yes, but these are the preliminary questions and not all of them by any means. In a spreadsheet and measured each of them with a caliper and calculated a mean length or girth. But it occurs to me many must have, which is wonderful. I'm nonetheless pretty sure that this is the longest pen I own. And this is the shortest. Isn't that adorable? The Duke 600 comes in, I would somewhat slobbishly guess, around the mid-range. Capped, it is 13.4 centimetres in length, and uncapped, it is 11.1 centimetres in length. It weighs in at 36 grams capped and 24 grams uncapped, give or take a few mils of ink. About 200 Venuses have been found so far. So many, in fact, that in <laughs> what seems to be a somewhat fetishistic hallmark of our species, someone's gone and stuffed them into pigeonholes of their own personal creation. With archaeological finds, context is of the essence. When you're trying to figure out the implications of whatever it is you've dug up. The context of our Venus has, however, already been muddied weirdly somewhat in advance by other members of our species, christening them Venus figurines. These figurines have nothing to do with the pagan Roman Greek goddess Venus a la Aphrodite or Astarte, who appeared on her rock some several thousand years and then some subsequently. So calling them Venus is a bit confusing and for some, for various reasons, also quite loaded and controversial. Anyway, ignore that. The main thing I meant to talk about is the context of the object. Was your well-endowed statuette found in a location we might interpret as special? Or was it dug up alternatively among the types of old fish bones and unwelcome debris that might point to it having been slung on a rubbish heap? Is it unfired or low fired, perhaps surviving only because it was burnt in a fire by accident? Or has it gone through some intentional artisanal procedure? Guesswork about these sorts of things is more or less all we have to help us determine whether an object is an icon held in reverence or an everyday item for everyday sort of contemplation. The Venus of Holofels, for example, was found 70 centimetres away from none other than a flute made from vulture bone. Oh, you say, oh! We're talking about 40,000 years, possibly more. We are, in fact, talking about the oldest known uncontested musical instrument, sat considerably less than two biblical cubits away from the oldest known piece of uncontested figurative art. So with this bombshell pairing, plus a few other bits and pieces of loot, what we have on our hands in Holofels is a compelling prehistorical cultural setting dating from the very cusp of behavioural modernity. All signs are that this was not an insignificant object, not by a long shake of a woolly mammoth's tail, but, 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 we mustn't get carried away. Others might, others have, I shan't, promise. <laughs> There's something of a trend among certain 19th century historians around the time people started digging up these Venus figurines, picked up again by scholars in the 1960s and 70s to interpret them as evidence for the worship of a great mother goddess. They saw a magical or shamanistic figure in these objects, an icon or tool of worship. There was a desire among these scholars to locate a distant epoch of humanity that was some sort of egalitarian, matrifocal, matrilineal elysium, a lost civilization possessed of all sorts of capabilities and potential. 
In ancient times, the Atlanteans were said to have an advanced technology and power supply based on crystals. It's not a particularly well-regarded idea anymore outside the fringes of archaeology. But the idea has proven to have a great deal of cultural currency and durability, as well as existing in Wiccan tradition. The point is, just as we feel imprisoned by other people's thinking, we mustn't get carried away imposing our own agenda on things that ends up building a prison for ourselves all over again. Top tip. We've got to take ourselves out of the equation entirely. It's not clear whether the artist's intentions were to create lifelike representations or exaggerated, idealised or what. Some people think that the exaggerated features of the figurines, the way they depart from objective anatomy and the frequent lack of a visible face, all that may be explained by the fact this is how the body might have looked from the fixed angle of self-regard. In other words, female artists without access to mirrors looking downwards on their bodies. Some, such as the stunning 11,000-year-old Venus of Monroe's less than two centimetres carved in jet, were very clearly pendants, jewellery. As for the decorative aspects of the Duke 600, I am drawn further into some sort of multi-sensory contemplation of its shapeliness by its smooth and apparently thick lacquered surface. It's a very tactile, pleasing object. It's a metal pen underneath, hence the sort of heft in the hand. But the surfacing is so shiny and smooth. It makes me think of a rat-a-tat-tat -tat sort of painted nails on a precision engineered surface. I love also the tomato red soft colour of mine. And this is set off by the silver accents, the banding around the top of the shaft and the base of the cap, as well as the clip and at the bottom of the pen. The banding around the top of the shaft is decorated with a symmetrical dots and zigzags design, whereas the band on the cap is unadorned. These sort of kiss together. And the pen caps with a particularly satisfying click, which takes me straight back to those fingernails. The clip has fancy lettering on it with the name flipped, 600 Duke. And I guess they flipped the order there because the large sized Duke fits more easily on the wider part of the clip before it tapers. In fact, the clip design mirrors almost identically the blobular shapeliness of the shaft itself. The design of the shaft is also pointed up by the terminal disc of smooth edged winking silver metal at the lower finial which draws your eye down 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 the length of the shaft taking in the overall tapering shape. I can't help but point up the affinities this shape has with our tapering footless Venuses. And to do this, I want to show you the Venus of Dolni Vestonitsa, which typifies the Venus shape up against this pen. This particular Venus, 11.1 centimeters in height, so just a bit shorter than the Duke, was unearthed in what is now the Southern Czech Republic in 1925. Radiocarbon dating puts its age up to 31,000 years old, making it the oldest known example of ceramics. Something hidden on the Dolny Vestonitsa figurine found only very recently also offers a touching hint at the real humans, like you or me whose gaze with eyes like yours or mine took in the object as you or I do now. A tomographic scan in 2004 found a three by five millimeter sized partial fingerprint on the rear of the object. By analyzing the breadth of the ridges shown on the fingerprint, researchers determined the fingerprint's culprit to be a girl aged somewhere between seven and 15 years old who handled the figurine before it was fired. This in itself is fuel for the imagination. It's intriguing to think of a child being present at the time the object was made. And you have romantic images of a girl staring rapt as her mother or sister works a ball of clay, skillfully drawing it into a shape she recognizes, but doesn't. Looking on it as an object of aspiration or desire. The anthropologist 
Eric Trinkhouse observed human bones from the site that showed signs of walking long distances, carrying heavy burdens, and times when food was scarce. Harboring hopes for survival and longevity would make some sense. On the other hand, there's a huge crack in the figurine's hip damage sustained when the object was fired at 800 degrees Celsius. Researchers have observed the kiln it was fired in was located 80 meters upslope from a dwelling area separate from the community. Around the kiln, accumulations of other ceramic artifacts, bears, lions, horses, foxes, rhinos, and owls, and thousands of clay balls and pellets. More than 5,000 have been found in all. Radiographers determined how they were made and the composition of the materials killed and hearth sites were excavated and then recreated by researchers who determined the vast majority of these objects, thousands upon thousands, were exploded intentionally by their makers soon after they were sculpted. What we see at the site of the Venus of Dolni Vestonica is repetition and both transmission and learning of a specific patterned behavior that involved firing and sometimes exploding of the figurines. This may have been the prime function of the ceramics at the site rather than being manufactured as permanent portable objects. There are holes in the top of the Venus's head into which perhaps resin would be dribbled and a, a sprigs of herbs and flowers stuck before the objects joined others in a ritualistic performance involving continuous processions of exploding figurative sculptures possibly taking place over the course of many generations. Maybe our Venuses can't serve as a trapdoor into a refreshingly straightforward or realistic idea about body image. After all, all that is clear is that we have no idea what the hell they were up to. But a few things we can be sure of. They were seeking to express themselves, shaping the clay and the bone to process their imaginations, to find meaning. And perhaps it's when we lose sight of our own potential to do things like that, that we accept celebrity on the beach, hello magazine, implausible diet touting, consolation culture. Goodbye aging obscurity and hello magazine. A wiser option altogether might be to take inspiration from the women of Donny Vestonica, draw all the baggage, all the angst and worry into one place and then make it explode. Take a firm grip on idols and hurl them into the fire. Move forward without them. You don't need them, do you? All this talk of firm grips and taking control can mean only one thing, the writing sample. But first, the minor matters of price and availability. Now this is a funny one. I bought this pen for about 80 RMB in China, where I was located for most of the first half of 2020. It was about midway through the year, perhaps. I, I don't know what's happened to the way this pen is produced since then, or perhaps my, my, my Googling skills are, just aren't up to scratch, but I can only find, on the one hand, sort of once upon a time expired listings for this pen on Amazon and AliExpress. On the other hand, there's a rather enthusiastically priced listing for this pen on eBay for $239. I, <laughs> I wish I'd bought a few of them. At RMB 80, about $12.23 or £9.11, I'd say absolutely buy this pen, but at $239, perhaps not. Now, why buy this pen? Well, because it's a lovely, pleasurable writer. Unbelievably, because I forgot to mention it earlier, I have another little prelude to the writing experience part of this review. I may have blushed mentioning it earlier anyway, but perhaps I should have mentioned it because it gives real credence to my notion that this pen, like our Venus figurines, is a resolute expression and maybe endorsement of the more interesting angles on bodily shapeliness. And it comes before we even uncap the pen at the top of the cap. The pen is all metal and lacquer bar the plastic feed, except for this little paste-made jewel thing. I say thing. Or do I mean nipple on top of the cap? It's got a little silvery metal areola as well. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> and and it's, it's a very pleasant addition to the pen. 
Okay, onwards. Uncapped, you, you get that lovely click again. Isn't that good? Uncapped and in the hand, the pen's bulbous design makes even more sense to me. You can see how there's a tapering plunge on the section, same as on the shaft. It really is like cradling a bulb or, or an invincible egg, perhaps, in your hand. Very, very nice to hold on to. And the shaft connects up with the section via the banding we scrutinized earlier. I should have also mentioned that in addition to the dotted zigzags design on the shaft band, there's a ducal coronet or crown. And rather delightfully, the metal threads on this pen appear to have been cast as such that every time you screw and unscrew the section from the shaft, the ducal coronet will line up with the slit on the nib. And this is a nice little subtle hallmark of quality. The section itself has these latticed diamonds ground into the metal for a bit of grippy texture and fingertip control. That's especially helpful if you're writing for a while. Posting. This pen does welcome posting. For some reason, it doesn't look like it would to me when capped, but it does. Very secure, very securely posted. Downward dip in the profile of the cap sits very neatly on the web between thumb and forefinger. However, when you're writing post it does, it feels a bit back heavy and generally quite heavy actually to me, a bit unwieldy. And I just enjoy the pen more unposted. The nib I think is a number five. It has another bigger crown or coronet in the center of a circle, which is perhaps meant to be the sun because there are perhaps these sun rays shooting forth away from it, fanning out across the shoulders of the nib. In terms of imprint, aside from those decorative aspects, we have only the word Duke in capitals, stuck right down near the base of the nib. Then you have these little Doric ordered steps bunching down towards a little finger stop to halt your fingers from traveling onto the surface of the nib or the page while writing. I really like the way this pen writes. There's a sort of squeak to it, a sort of added grippiness on the, on the page. It doesn't exactly glide. Some may not enjoy this sensation, but again, that word that's always bound up with fountain pens for me, velvet. The nib has velvet in spades, which I adore. And that's how I'd characterize the resistance it gives you. I don't want to over-describe that sensation. It's just a thing to notice rather than what has total dominance over the writing experience for me. There's also a softness, a kind of blushing, smooth quality to the way it writes, the way it distributes ink that I really like. This is a pen that encourages me to write small and in a way that is, for me anyway, precise. Lucky. Panda. Six. Jinxed. Zebra. Game of West. And I'm writing on Claire Fontaine Triumph paper, by the way. I was sent dozens of these pads a while back and they're very, very pleasant and useful. The ink is bog standard pilot blue. If you found this pen sold somewhere at a reasonable price, do share a link in the comments. And if the choice comes down to a bout of electromagnetic shock exercise therapy or, or whatever, whatever it is, or buying one of these delightful pens, well, you know what to do. If you enjoyed watching this review. Firstly, thank you. And secondly, please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to Panda Pen Club on YouTube. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.